Um, so I'm just letting you guys know that today is an exciting webinar where we're going to be talking about the concept of workism and how workism um, is maybe making work so much the center of our lives we've forgotten about other things, our families, our communities, maybe even our environment. And we're going to have Peter Senke join us. He was certainly somebody who founded uh, some ideas around systems thinking that really influenced my thinking um, at Third Path when I started our organization 20 years ago. We're also going to hear from Mary Bliss Conger. She's someone who's super smart about systems thinking, and she's putting these ideas into practice in her own life personally and in the work she thinks about. So it should be a really amazing webinar. All right, so what is workism? Workism is this idea that seems to be happening more and more today where so many of us are having work come first. We're gaining our identity from work. Our communities are centered around work. We're seeing work as the most important thing in our lives, maybe even more than family, community, maybe even our environment. And so today's webinar is a, little, a chance to look at this and think about what's going on that's fa factoring this in and how do economics play a role? But before we get into some specifics about economics, Peter, any thoughts you have about uh, why workism might be happening today, or if this is something that you're seeing even beyond the United States? Tell us, Peter. Well, there's a, probably a couple of obvious contributing factors. <clears throat> One is the way that technology has extended the, the feasible workday. So if you think about it, the, the industrial era concept of work itself was was rather new and different. In other words, if you go back, you know, 500 years in most places of the world, I'm not even sure people had the notion of work as something separate. You had your life and you were a tradesperson or you were a farmer or you were whatever. And, and you know, you, you did the things you did in your life. But the industrial age became an era of, of really fragmenting things. So you now had a formal job. You had to go someplace for your work. You had an employer. Um, keep in mind, for most of human history, people never had employers. So that was kind of a, a big shift. And, and, and so this idea that you are kind of wedded to your employer was true because you'd given away, you might say, um, efficacy. Your well-being depended upon your job. You had a job in order to make money, in order to whatever, ever, ever you wanted to do. So it seems to me workism is now kind of the next stage in this evolution in a way. It's now not just at a place you go. So I may say the most obvious contributing factor to this is the way technology has allowed us to effectively extend the work day. So if you're still wedded to that job or you're wedded to that employer, what I mean by that is your sense of well-being and security are tied to this and now it's become more and more uh, all inclusive it never ends and then yeah. you know you get you get yeah. real shifts in different organization cultures but a lot of them now expect that everybody should be responsive basically all the time to whatever is being requested it doesn't make any sense ultimately it's totally crazy but interimly if you kind of think of it as an extension of that um uh, fealty or that that sense of subservience to your employer now your employer is this continuous stream of requests that never ends so that's an obvious contributing factor i think there's a subtler one uh to some degree this may be a big escape the world around us is yeah. so much in disarray there's so many things to um to really concern us I mean, particularly now the social and environmental, the extraordinary imbalances in the world. And you see this amongst kids. Kids are extraordinarily uh, fearful of the future today. Um, so in that sense, you need a place to run. Work is and be play, becomes that escape. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you. You've just summed up some of the key issues that we want to look at today. Um, and that last one, I think, Really, I'm so glad you put that one on the table, too, um, because I do think work is something that we feel like we kind of have more control over, some more immediate outcomes yeah. from, you know, we put X in and then you get an outcome out, and there's a lot of other things that we feel like we have absolutely no control over. So we will certainly circle, circle back to that very, very important point, too. 
Um, and thank you for starting with technology, because we're going to certainly talk about how technology has influenced all of this today. Thank you. Excellent. So let me put a couple of points around the economics of all this, too, and see if you want to add something to this. Certainly, as Third Path is exploring people who are actually doing this very differently, we have a whole community of people who don't do work as a We've been growing for the last 20 years a community of men and women, some parents, some not, some leaders, some not, who have said, work is one part of my life, but not all of my life. And by growing that community of people who've been following this integrated approach, we've learned a lot about what they've done to actually push back at workism, which then gives us some clues about why it's so hard for other people. So, for example, another factor that's happened is that there's insecure employment. It used to be that you had, you know, a, you know, if you were a shoemaker, you were a shoemaker your entire life. If you were working at a company, you even had lifetime employment and a gold watch when you retired. Good benefits, too. That's all disappeared. Um, we've also seen, as we've looked at this issue for 20 years, that organizations, you mentioned work cultures, there are too many organizations that really reward people who put work first. Right. And that really uh, sets up family systems to have to think about how, ri how much risk can we take if we're going to put limits around work. We've got we've to gotta beat the baby. <laughs> we've got to put a roof over our head. What kind of risk can we handle as a family as we're trying to balance the, the needs of a family and the demands of a workforce work culture. And of course, all of us have seen there's been a huge change in the cost of living. Just take a look at student debt. It's kind of scary. Talk about fear. Um, when people graduate from college with an amount of huge amount of debt, it definitely plays out in how they make choices and what they feel like they can choose. Any thoughts about the economics and how this plays out, Peter? Well, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it, the, that uh, economic insecurity uh, is is a big deal for a lot of people. It, it's a bit age dependent, as you were saying. You know, if you've kind of graduated from college in the last uh, 20 years, it's likely. To be a deal. Um, but again, I, I think these are at some level. You know, life is full of sources of insecurity. It's not new. It's just the particulars change over time. Um, how yeah. you find how you find a way to ground yourself to be present and not be overly caught up to not be emotionally you know hijacked by the insecurity um, that that's a that's a really a different question yeah yeah oh my gosh because that's actually what we've learned from our what we call shared care families or whole life leaders because what they've been very careful is constantly saying well what's really most important to me can mm -hmm. I figure out how to, we call it a, a life-centered approach to finances. They figured out how do I set up, you know, what's enough income, what's uh, the right spending so I can live the life I want. Now, of course, we need some really good public policy to make this available to everybody, but you're right. Those who have some choices, the more intentional they can be and not getting caught up in some stuff. That's a great point. I'm going to, there's not more, not that there isn't more to say about this, um, because I, I feel like, uh, again, this is going to be a, a conversation where we just want to talk more about each point. But if we went on to talk a little bit about this issue of risk, um, here's where it plays out. You know, most people do end up having children, although that's changing. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but in the, you know, when maybe when Third Path started, 80% of women ended up having children. That's a high ratio of people choosing to become parents. And I think um, one of the things that's gone on in a, in a work first or workism approach to um, this way we're being is that there's not very many people out there who model anything besides kind of all in or all out. So if you are at work and everybody seems to be focused on work and nobody seems to be talking about anything else and that perhaps contributes to all of this too, is there's just kind of very few models of people thinking differently, which perpetuates more people to make, to not even know there's an alternative choice. 
How, do, how much is that playing out in this, do you think, Peter? Well, I think it's it's a lot. I mean, if you think about it, if you go back again, to me, the industrial age is kind of the point of reference. Because it, things weren't always that way, and human beings didn't show up on the planet, you know, in, in 1780, <laughs> or whatever you date the beginning of right. the industrial age. Uh, so there's, a, there's kind of an older, kind of almost uh, DNA of who we are. But then things change a lot, and you get very uh, centered on a job, an employer, all the things I was talking about before. Um, I think that that's the context for a lot of this insecurity now. You know, we, 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 we had, you might say, a deal we understood. You know, the honest days uh, pay for an honest day's work. We kind of understood that deal. Now the deal has changed. Now it's like whatever amount of work is demanded is is what we expect we have to come up with and 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 so it's a very unnatural situation that's why you know the only thing we can probably say for sure is it won't last forever it, it, there's really almost no no precedent for this and i think that yeah. um losing touch with what matters to us has been going on for a long time i, I think that's not uh -huh. that, that when when your life is about your job in a traditional sense you've already begun to lose track. And of course, consumerism offers then a different deal. You work a lot, so you make a lot of money so you can buy a lot, and that'll make you happy. And keep in mind that right. too, relatively new idea. Consumerism really characterized the US economy and eventually most of the world's economies in the second half of the last century. That's the whole consumer era. And so then the deal changed. Yeah. You work a lot, you earn a lot, so you can buy a lot. And dot, dot, dot. The real question is, so yeah. what? You can buy a lot. Yeah. The, the premise is, yeah. you know, you have to feel that that's what you need to make you happy. Or to put it differently, you have to assume you are unhappy and all you can do is buy something to replace the unhappiness or overcome it. Yeah. So this notion that you could actually be happy by being happy, by just being doing whatever you're doing, being wherever you are, is really been steadily being eroded. Yeah. So that that's why all this and stuff I, is so uneasy. We've kind of lost our base. Yeah. Well, and you and I'm so glad again you raised consumerism. Um, again, think about it and control. Right. What do we have control over? What do we not have control over? So you know you're having a bad week. You know, and you're feeling overworked and you're getting home stressed. Well, you know, buying something is very easy to do, and it is kind of like you know like taking a drink or other things that we've turned to to kind of numb ourselves a little bit. It's quick and easy, and we think it's going to make us happy, but consumerism and the debt that we create um, obviously has created, you know, all kinds of problems for us. So, again, all of these things are we, we could talk more about. Um, and as, you know, Peter said, technology is really at the root of all this. Uh, so I have a slide up here where I'm kind of showing this color yellow because all of this is happening where we're interconnected at the speed of a nanosecond. We can now communicate to each other about different things and how that has played out and reinforced this. Um, you know, uh, we're going to talk a little bit later in the webinar about how, you know, uh, social media and how we, you know, want to present a certain image to the world. And so it all kind of becomes this negative reinforcing loop. That's the concept of systems thinking. There's positive reinforcing loops where things go in a positive way and get better. And there's negative reinforcing loops where certain different parts of the system reinforce each other to create a movement in, the, in a negative way. And so all of this, the economic uncertainty, the consumerism, the you know, quick instant um, technology, no ends of our work days, all, I, I, I think it's 100% right, Peter. This, we've been losing track of what's important for a long time, and technology seems to really be exacerbating that. Anything you want to add about technology, maybe something hopeful, you don't have to. Uh, any thoughts before I go on to the next slide after that? Well, just the one um, kind of obvious thing, but it's happened quickly, so I don't think we really noticed it too much, which is the, the extent, the intrusiveness 
of the technology. Yeah. You know, I cannot keep track of the number it keeps going up so fast, but the number of times a day a person looks at their gadget. Um, I mean, yeah. it's like, you know, 800 or 950 or whatever. It's bizarre. And, and of course, we know the business model of those companies, which is whatever it takes to occupy your attention, that's it. We'll do whatever it yeah. takes to occupy your attention. Because we can occupy your attention, then we can get you to pay attention to what we want you to pay attention to. So this yeah. kind of uh, a scarcity of attention is relatively new. You, you didn't really have this problem 10 years ago. And the other thing is that obviously it's like addicting young kids to salts and sugar. You want to start as early as possible because the earlier you can get the addictive spiral started, the harder it is for people to break it. And of course, that's why you want to addict kids to screens by the time they're one or two years old. And oftentimes the parents are witting com unwitting com uh, accomplices in this. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm getting a little bit depressed, but I think you're 100% right. The parallel between addicting kids to sugars and salts early on and addicting kids to screens early on. Boy, that's going to be another powerful thing for us to circle back to. Um, wow, uh, not sounding so good. So here's the sad truth. People who are listening in today, it's not just what's happening at work that's also creating this negative cycle of workism and work first approach. It's also what's happening at home. Over the last, I don't know, how many years, we've had a huge change in how we think about family. And in many ways, for good, right? We want to create a world where we can use the creative energy and experience of women at work and the creative energy and experience of men at work. But what's happened is we've gone from a world where somebody was creating time for family to perhaps a world where there's very little time for family. And there's lots and lots of repercussions for that. I think one of the saddest is how it looks like people experience this as a personal family problem. So men and women are angry at each other in their own homes because they're exhausted from this demands of the workplace, the gerbil wheel of consumerism and working that they're on. And they take that anger out at home. We can see it in book titles like How to Not Hate Your Husband After Having Kids because we're trying to think in new ways about work and family, what do women do, what do men do, what do mothers do, what do fathers do, and they're up against workplaces that still want to reward someone who puts work first. So this change in our assumptions about what we do outside of work has been really challenged. And I don't think we have great models yet around how to think differently around the home environment. Peter, are you seeing that as part of the problem too? And what do you think about all that? Well, I, th I think you can see both. Um, obviously, the, 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 the two worker family, two adult worker family, which again, if you think about it, 50 years ago, that was very unusual. Today, it's, it would be very unusual to not have that. That's partly been driven by economics, of course, and partly driven by a shift in social norms that you know both adults in the home should have employment because that's what you should do, which leads to the obvious question is, what, what about the kids? Um, and and I, I just, you know, the only thing that seems to me important to remind us of, you know, we're biological before we are cultural. In other words, the deepest conditioning in us is, is the oldest, and it comes from our biological roots. And cultures uh, on the surface, norms can shift relatively quickly. Again, think about you know the two adult working family as a norm. That's really happened in a relatively short period of time, you know, literally a few decades. Um, but adults being with children and the meaningfulness, I'm saying this in a very particular way, because I think we misplace it if we talk only about parenting. Because keep in mind, for the vast majority of our history as humans, we lived in tribes. It didn't really matter whose kids they were. They were, they were our kids. So this sense of shared responsibility for the well-being of children, whether or not I'm the biological parent, is actually deeper 
the sense of well-being for children. That's why even today, of course, in a spontaneous moment, no one would think twice about rushing in to try to save a child in a burning building. You don't say, oh, is that my child? If it's not my child, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> you don't think that way. That's the biological. Yeah. Deeply embedded in us. Right. That's what I think. The parenting part to me, I think, should be fluid. I think that, you know, that that's that's really secondary. It's the opportunity to have a meaningful amount, uh, amount of our lives connected to kids that I think is far and away the more important. That's also at risk, of course, with this workism, you know, who has time for it? But I think that that if we can just keep that in mind, you know, for example, you know, you can adopt a kid or, or birth a kid. Really, what difference does it make? Really? You don't care because it's the opportunity to help a young person. You can work with kids in a million different settings. There's a lot of need for that. There's a lot of ways you can make children a part of your life beside being parents in, a, in any kind of traditional sense. So I think that's the deeper issue. It's quite clear to me that when adults have too little time around kids, they suffer. And of course, the kids suffer because that's, again, our history. Our history is to live in mingled environments with children and adults together. And you know, that's why, you know, at different stages in life, you know, time a kid is 12 or 13, they really need a lot of uncles and aunts in their families, right? They need access to other adults. Right. The last thing you want to do is talk to your parents about some of the stuff you worry about when you're that age. So that's just another example right. of, kind of deep tribal root. Right. Wow, wow. What a great point. Because again, that's one of the things I've always said at Third Path. It's not so much that there's a right answer. But I think what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, when someone really um, is excited by the idea of work and creating time for children in whatever way they do or communities in whatever they do, it goes back to that kind of deeper DNA of what makes right. us happy. And, um, right. and that that's always, you know, why we, we believe in this third path. The idea of a third path is that um, we... We think of work as one of many things we do, uh, an important one, but not the only one. Um, so I'm, I'm putting up a, um, mm -hmm. a slide. We don't have to spend too much talking, time talking about it, but it's a slide by a woman who looked at uh, three different countries, the U.S., uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, excuse me, Sweden, U.S., Denmark, and China, and kind of saw a growing phenomena of um, lower fertility in all three countries. And I... I bring this up because um, what we're seeing is even in countries where they've really been trying to encourage um, greater uh, time for family, like Denmark, where they have really good uh, paternity leave and parental leave, um, they are still having a decrease in fertility, um, just like in China, just like in the U.S. So these wealthier countries are experiencing a decrease in fertility. Um, and to me, it, it's speaking to what you're talking about, um, that somehow what's been lost is uh, the beauty of being able to connect to other humans in the ways that make sense to us and how that grounds us and gives us purpose. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how social media plays into that and this concept of chronic you know, distraction, but any, anything you want to add about how all of this comes together um, well, and, and it's kind of reinforcing this. Yeah, first off, I think the fertility decline is a red herring. I think fertility should decline. You know, one of okay. the biggest problems in the world is, is, is not only population growth in terms of numbers, it's the footprint of our, uh, the, the, the footprint on the larger natural living systems of a growing population that's a wealthier population that consumes and wastes a lot more. So actually, the the, uh, the the demographic transition is absolutely essential. Reduced population growths are absolutely essential. So there's nothing inherently wrong with a fertility decline. And in that, in part, should come from more choice. You know, people can choose whether or not to be biological parents. Um, but I, that's why I was making the point I was making before. I think it's a red herring because I don't think, you know, giving birth to kids is the only source of having meaningful relationships with children. I think there's a million ways to do that. That's what's really important. 
it's not, you know, if I have a bunch of babies. And in fact, the world needs us to have a lot less babies. I mean that, so the fertility decline is a good thing. So you might say, why are we so concerned about it? I think we're concerned about it because it means that you have more and more adults who grow up without meaningful relationships with children, it's gonna be a much more unhappy world. That's why we really should wow. be, but not because of fertility right. decline, per se. Yeah, yeah, well, so you're helping me, actually you just expanded my mind today, thank you. I knew this would be a, uh, a call where we all learned something. And to me, uh, what I just learned is, um, when I think about the third path, I, I think the way I'm going to be thinking about it now is, you know, whether or not you have kids, it's work plus some sort of meaningful relationships in your life, time right. for meaningful relationships that you are really investing in, um, and that those uh, meaningful relationships, I think, create what I've seen in the integrated people that we work with, create a great counterpoint to the workism, and they help people then make better choices. Yes, right. I could go work more hours. Yes, I could buy more things. But I'm committed to this meaningful relationship, so I don't want to just spend all my time working. I want to create time for this other thing. Very right. interesting, Peter. Oh, right. thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So where we're at in the webinar is talking about this kind of these two, uh, when I read uh, the fifth discipline, he talked about the mental models, that we need to create a mental model that helps us then kind of imagine where we're trying to go and then we can reach for that mental model and you just help me think more about that the mental model third path finder promote is work plus other meaningful relationships versus just work 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 and um and so i want us to get a chance to talk about these two competing mental models i'm going to have mary conger speak up in a second there might be one more thing peter you want to say before we hear from mary well, I mean, just to clarify the notion of mental models, it's not rocket science, you know. You, it's not good, it's not bad. We all have mental models. We have pictures in our heads of families. We have pictures in our heads of happiness. We have pictures. The problem is not that. We always have pictures in our heads. To some degree, they're individual, and to some degree, they're collective. So we tend to, you know, have the pictures in our heads that to some degree are uh, instantiated or located in our cultural context. Um, but the main problem with it is we, we confuse what's in our head with what's real. We, we think that our mental yeah. model are reality as opposed to assumptions about reality. So is when you really start to recognize the kind of constructed nature of mental models, both individually and collectively, it actually can free you because they're not, they appear to us as rigid, fixed, this is the way it is. But in fact, they're constructions, social constructions. And if they don't serve us, we can construct different mental models. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And I think uh, in preparing for today's webinar, I didn't realize how much the work uh, Third Path has been doing for 20 years um, has been doing exactly that, uh, really kind of constructing a different mental model, both for how we can approach home how we can approach our work. Um, and I think what I didn't know 20 years ago is I think it's the antidote to workism. So mm -hmm. Mary, you've been listening in to Peter and I talk about some of these things today. You might be muted, so you can unmute and join the conversation. We want to hear what you have to say about some of the conversation that we've had so far around workism and how it's, what's been contributing to it and how do we push against it. Tell us what you're thinking, Mary. Thanks for the invitation to do so. Um, it's been nice to just listen. I really uh, agree with a lot of what has been said. I think another piece of the puzzle we haven't maybe touched on yet is um, what is pushing us away from home, if we want to think about it in a binary, which it obviously isn't. But we've talked a lot about what might be drawing us to work or keeping us um, at work or attracted to work or oriented toward work. But I'm also, I, I've really thought a lot about what, um, what are we sort of resisting when we let that happen? It's not just a, a draw to work. I think sometimes it is actually a push away from home. 
And um, by home, I might mean here also kind of use it as a proxy of that larger question you, you guys have touched on as well about meaning, right? These, these intimate relationships, these values that we have, the really the, the very big picture of what we want our life to be, not just our productivity to be. Mm -hmm. um, if you permit me a, a short story, <laughs> when I was uh, a 16, yeah. I grew up in a really small town, um, very isolated, about 600 people. Um, and I worked in a nursing home and hospital as a certified nursing assistant when I was a teenager. And I spent a lot of time with people who were very sick and who were dying. And one thing I saw very clearly was uh, who came to visit those people, what the end of their lives looked like, and what they talked about and seemed preoccupied with as they were really facing the end of their lives um, or some really hard, hard times in terms of health and healing. And it will come as no surprise, but no one talked about work. Mm. No one talked about work. Yeah. If they talked about work, okay. it was the regrets they had. And so, you know, that they spent too much time or that they wished they had tried something else or whatever it might have been. And, you know, I don't want to be overly saccharine about it, but that really impressed upon me as a young person. What's the end game? What are we really trying to do? big picture. So that's always been been part of my um, thinking about life, I guess, which I consider a, a blessing, something I was really lucky to get early on. Um, cool. But it, it points me to the bigger question of how are people today making sense out of this incredibly um, rapidly changing, very complex world around us? And how are we finding meaning? And frankly, I think that work is, it, you know, as I think Peter said, it's big escape um, from a lot of these kind of more existential questions that we might have about how to find meaning, how to find connection outside of the parameters of work. Work makes it so, as much as there are things we don't like about it, um, I try to think about the needs that it's meeting for a lot of us. And sure, some of that is economic, um, but I think a lot of that really is um, also, it's an easy place to connect with others. It's clean. We kind of understand the mandate. We know what to do. We can feel competent and rewarded. And the domestic sphere, for lack of a better term, is kind of the opposite. <laughs> Home is hard. Yeah. It can be awkward. Um, culturally, we don't value it. Nobody is getting a bonus at the end of the year for being a great parent. And I think this is the case for um, you know, parents regardless of gender, but there are some really gendered aspects to that that differ. And so another thing about parenting <laughs> is that it's often boring. You know, it's a lot of, especially for folks who haven't grown up or spent time in intergenerational spaces. Right. You know, I'm based in, in New York and um, a lot of people I know here who have kids and excuse me for my shortness of breath, I myself am very pregnant right now, and so I can't breathe very well. But a lot of people that I know here, especially men, the very first baby they ever hold or interact with is their own. Mm. And so, you know, as a species, <laughs> we wouldn't be here if that had been the case in the past. Mm. But I think a lot of us don't feel competent as parents, especially at the beginning, we haven't seen models for how to do this. We don't have those, um, you know, the mental models we might have are, are often 30 years old or they're really dominated by media. Um, and we're just generally unsure of how to do this. We're also doing it to point back to the piece about technology. We're doing it in a time of incredible distraction and incredible um, uh, comparison Right, we can all see each other's pictures on social media. Um, we're all getting inundated with advertisements and blog posts about how to parent or what parenting should look or feel like. Um, and we're not actually forming a lot of meaningful connections in person. We can look at something like, um, I think it was like the mid 90s, right? Robert Putnam and Bowling Alone. There's been a real decline in the institutions that have connected us historically outside of work. And so I think that there are a, a lot of things that, um, you know, there's sort of the attractors to work 
and there are the things that we're resisting at home or that that aren't as comfortable and we really have to uh, think about those too so i'll yeah. i'll pause there. oh my gosh yeah no thank you thank you for for all that you just said and again i feel like this is i knew this would be a webinar for us to really all lead smarter um, and I think you're 100% right, Mary, that um, we have to look at what's happening at home and kind of the messiness of home, the sometimes boring parts of home, although the very meaningful parts of home. Um, it's funny, as I was listening to you, literally I had tears in my eyes because I am visiting my mom right now, who's an amazing, competent 90-year-old, um, but we have very straightforward conversations when I come to visit her about how I'm not sure if I'll get to visit her again and even though it's hard for me to get here, and I can only do half the work I want to do when I'm here, talk about meaning. <laughs> and so, you know, these are choices we have to make constantly over and over again about how to use our time and our resources in a way that feels most aligned with what's important to us, even when it's not the easy answer. Maybe because it's not the easy answer, we still want to do it. Peter, you listened to some really wise comments from Mary. There might be one or two things you want to quickly say before we get to a couple of last slides and get to, believe it or not, the end of our webinar. Peter, any thoughts you want to add? Well, I think, I think she made some really important points that we really hadn't touched on before. Um, I mean, you talked about the messiness of home, or maybe you could call it the ordinariness of it, uh, maybe in a sub kind of a judgmental sense, we could say the mundaneness of mm -hmm. it, the everyday of it, um, that's life, right? I mean, again, the work becomes a place you escape to because you, you're living in, a, in, a, in this continual adrenaline rush. Adrenaline rush is, is only one part of life. You know, there's the kind of slow ordinariness, which is life. Uh, the one other thing that really struck me and again, I'm always kind of anchor to some degree in trying to understand these things on the 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 um, um, anomaly of the last few hundred years. I know that sounds weird, yep. but the industrial age is an anomalous period. One of the things that grows in the industrial age, where it's all about machines and technologies, is this belief in control. You know, it, it's, a, it's a bad piece of technology if you can't control it, right? And and your car that turns left when you want to go right is not a good car. And and we get frustrated <laughs> when we have a new app and we can't make it do what we want to do right away. Guess what? That's life. When you're a parent, you are living in a world that's not about control. You cannot control your kids. Yeah. And if you try to, everybody gets frustrated. But of course, that's a, 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 a dance we all get caught up in that, you know, we try to control what we can't control. But sooner or later, you kind of give up. Um, and when you reach the latter parts of your life, you know, you're kind of surrendering this desire to be in control of everything. But that's a new idea. The idea that to be happy, you should be in control is an idea that is not a natural one for human beings. It's just an habitual one. We become habituated to it in the techn technological age. And that's it's a huge source of unhappiness. I would wow. add to that, Thank you. we also don't have places to make sense out of that. So we're experiencing yeah. that, but oh. we're not, um, you're getting less religious, for example. We're yeah. spending less time in integrated communities. Um, and so to really reckon with that, to sit with that, to make one's peace with that, um, there aren't a lot of, of opportunities, I think, for folks to do that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Hey, so let me tell you what we didn't get to, which is not a problem, because for those of you who are going to be able to stick around for the Q&A, we will perhaps get to these points at, um, in the q and A. I I mean, one of the uh, uplifting facts is that there is a community of people out there uh, who are doing it differently. And third pass, uh, important role we've played for the last 20 years is bringing that community together um, and bringing them to events that we have so they can meet each other and connect and learning from them about how they can you know, set limits at work so they have time for meaningful relationships. Um, in fact, we even learned that when people do this early in their careers, they become managers who then manage their teams to support people to have time for their lives. And again, it turns out this becomes a very effective way for the workplace of a 24-7 world. 
So we, we really learn positive things and we have events, activities to bring you in so you can meet people who are doing this. Um, in fact, you're going to hear in a second, we have an event coming up in April where you're going to meet people who figured out how to apply this at home. Mothers, fathers, two mom households, two dad households, whatever it is, they've been figuring out how to think about how to do work in a way where they have time for family, time for their children, time for their adopted children, time to be an uh, active uncle, whatever it is. Um, and so there really are answers out there. And just keep on tuning into the Thursday webinars and you're going to hear some of those answers. We also don't have time to talk about where does change begin? I have my own bias. I've seen people making this change in their lives and seeing how they continuously make it year after year seems to influence wider change. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the Q&A as well. All right, so we're almost out of time. What we're going to do next is a live Q&A. So those of you who are listening in today, you get to join us, ask questions. Both Peter and Mary will be sticking around for the live Q&A. All year long, we have a wonderful little giveaway for people who are able to join the live Q&A um, as a way to say thank you join, for joining us. So we have a little uh, giveaway that you can find out about of this Grateful Dad uh, pamphlet. What's coming next? We have an amazing webinar um, in February. I love this book, Raising the Race. Please join us. It's going to be another fabulous webinar, really looking at how there's our many diverse approaches to thinking about work-life integration. And we've got lots of free resources for you, including, as I mentioned, in April 30th, an event if, that you can join. If you are a coach, therapist, consultant, researcher, or just a passionate individual, we want you to join our Integrated Life Advocate Forum. It's a one-day event happening in Philadelphia. It's a pretty powerful experience. So there might be one last thing that Mary wants to say, and then I'm going to see if there's one last thing that Peter wants to say, um, and then I really hope you'll stick around for the live Q&A. So Mary, you might be muted, but we want to hear if there's one last thing you want to say, and then we'll hear, give the last word to Peter. Mary, any last words? Um, probably just speaking aloud that it's, it's very hard to be um, what you cannot see. And so when we are thinking about change, for me, it's been so helpful to, to read, to seek out um, examples, to speak out loud sort of the vision I have for how I want my life to be, even if I'm not sure how to get there, um, and to, to really reflect, to make this a, a regular practice, um, to always be in touch with what is that larger system we're working with beyond just balancing the scale of work and life. Yeah, wonderful, thank you. Um, what is the end game? Where are we going? Finding someone who we can talk to about that, finding books that inspire us about that. Thank you for your words of wisdom, Mary. They were really powerful. Peter, any last, last thoughts before we stop this recorded version and go to the live Q&A? Well, I think Mary uh, said, it, said it very well. I mean, you, these are the problems of living. You can't, you can't solve them by yourself. You know, whether it's, you know, just friends that you can talk to or, or partners that you can really talk with and, and inspire one another. I mean, again, it's not about figuring it out. It's not about having to have the answer. It's not about being in control. Life is not about being in control, but it is about yeah. uh, unfolding and growing. I mean, there's probably nothing more directly contributing to our happiness than our sense that we're growing, we're learning. We're, you know, we're, we're on a path. It's not about the destination. It's about being on a path. So I think it, it's not, it's not my problem. It's always our problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again, everybody for a wonderful webinar and please stay tuned for our live Q and A.